It's great to see all of you here today. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Christine Specht. I am the learning officer for YPO, and I'm also I had the privilege to co-chair this event uh, with uh, Stuart Banghart. So we're just delighted that you're here. Uh, you know, I was working with Mary Brown, who is the YPO Gold Learning Officer for the year, and she had a meeting, we, we got together, and she said, we have to bring in Peter Zihan. And I'm like, Peter who? And I, was, I didn't know, right? And she's like, oh no, he's, he's incredible. And so then I, you know, did a quick study, because he's everywhere on the internet, and then I was telling my husband, JJ, about him, and we were hooked. The daily videos, my husband read his latest book, which was fascinating, and he would tell me all about it as he was reading through it. And I thought, I, I just have to read the book myself. I mean, the historical content alone is just really fascinating to see how we came about as a nation. So you are just going to really enjoy tonight. Uh, you know, at the same time, you're, we're, you're left with this, this really, it's a juxtaposition. On one hand, like the world is, well, as he would say, is ending you know, as we currently know it, and that is pretty bad for most nations. On the other hand, the United States is probably gonna be okay, but it's not gonna be easy by any measure. And he'll talk a lot about that and what all that means. We have this sort of uh, tempered optimism, right? It's like, all right, we know this is happening, we can't stop change, so how can we get our minds around this to come out of this stronger and better and be prepared? So I think that's one of the blessings of YPO, to have speakers like Peter who can help us get ready for what's next. He has a very matter-of-fact approach and uh, what he delivers his message, and I think it's great because he also brings the receipts. He has the data, he has the analysis, and he's not afraid to share it. Uh, he also has just an authenticity. If you've ever had an opportunity to hear any of his videos that he puts out on a daily basis, for free, by the way, he just does this, uh, is really fascinating, and he presents the data in such a way that it is, um, without all the media hysteria, I don't know about you, but sometimes the media is just hysterical, and you think, what is really the truth? And I think Peter really helps to cut through all that. So, you're in just for a treat tonight, and I'll, now I will welcome Stuart Bankhart. He's going to formally introduce Peter, so thank you. Hi everybody, I'm just here to uh, introduce Peter, so I just have a few things to read for you. Um, pick it up? Oh, make it up. <laughs> um, no, we had dinner with uh, Peter last night, he's really a delightful guy, and, and you're really going to enjoy uh, this uh, presentation. I'm so glad to see so many people. Um, I didn't realize he was such a rock star, but uh, Peter, down reading. Uh, Peter combines a deep understanding of geography, demography, energy, and trade to help his clients uh, make sense of a complicated world. Fortune 500 companies, trade associations, policy makers, and government agencies at all levels regularly rely on his expertise. Uh, Peter is also a critically acclaimed author. So I got to know Peter from our forum was reading uh, accidental superpower, and it changed how I saw the world, so it was very interesting. Uh, his first two books, The Absent Superpower and Accidental Superpower, uh, are <laughs> recommended by Mitt Romney, uh, Ian Bremer, and Fareed Sakaria. This United Nations became available in March 2020, and Peter's fourth book, End of the World is Just Beginning, uh, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization, became available in June of 22. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's Good read, long read, I guess. Uh, and then Accidental Superpower, 10th year anniversary just came out. And uh, I'd like to see what the updates, I haven't read it yet, but see what the updates are. So, without any more ado, Peter Zion. First things first, I want everybody to take a deep breath. And we're going to take care of the news of the moment before I get into the important stuff, okay? So what's going on with Israel and Hamas? Eh. It's not going to turn into a wider war. Hamas doesn't have an army. They've got a paramilitary force. We saw what it is at its peak. That's not a threat to the existence of the Jewish state. 
Egypt used to control Gaza, and they, the Egyptians are the only people on the planet who hate the Palestinians more than the Israelis. Jordan is a satellite state. Syria's in a civil war. Lebanon is a failed state. And Hezbollah is many things, but it doesn't have an army at all. This isn't a bottle. The only way it bubbles out is if one country, Saudi Arabia, decides to do something with it. And they're having an argument within Riyadh about whether to sell out the Palestinians or not. Odds are they're going to. So, deep breath. This is not World War III. This is even World War 2.1. Okay. Everything else we're going to talk about today is an order of magnitude more important than that. Okay, we good? We good? All right, let's talk about Stalin. <laughs> this is the most important person to have lived in the last half millennia because he scared us. We were so terrified of facing down the Red Army on the plains of Europe that we changed the entire system. We created this idea of globalization not because we wanted to trade, because we knew we needed tens of millions of people to stand between us and the Russians, and the only way that we could come up with to get them to do that, to be suitably motivated, was to pay them. So we sent our navy abroad, the only one to survive the war, to patrol the global ocean so that anyone could go anywhere at any time and interface with any partner and access any commodity and play in any supply chain and sell into any market if you would be cannon fodder for us in the Cold War. And it worked. And then the Cold War ended. And in the last eight presidential elections, we have progressively chosen the leader who is less and less interested in keeping that going. And that includes the transition from Trump to Biden. From an international economic point of view, they are the two most similar presidents we have ever had. The only difference between the two is that Biden knows how to use a grammar checker. That's it. But this changed everything. And I think the best place for us to start is finance of all places. This is net worth by decade. It's an old story. As you get older, you get better at your job, your income goes up, you start a business, your income goes up. But the real magic happens at age 50. Because in Anglo-American in particular, at age 50, your single biggest expense, your youngest child, moves out and is someone else's problem. And the money that you save for being an empty nester, you typically use to pay down your second biggest expense, which is normally your homestead. And by 55, that's usually paid down as well. From 55 to 65, your income is the highest it will ever be, your expenses are under control, and that delta is what drives the system. That's the tax base, that's investment capital, that's 70% of total global private capital, the financial assets of that 10 year block. And then you retire and you liquidate everything because if there's a currency crash or a market crash, you no longer have the income that's necessary to hold the line. You become destitute. So you turn everything into relatively inert form. So stocks and bonds go away, T-bills and cash become the rule. This is normal, it's boring, and usually it doesn't matter because normally we have a population structure that looks like this. This is South Korea in the 1950s, at the dawn of globalization. We've got children on the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other. Normally, the ratio of people who retire every year is low compared to the overall population. And it doesn't change year on year, because there's always more people aged 64 below that and 63 below that and so on. But with globalization, this shifted. Before globalization, most people lived in an agricultural system. And when you live on a farm, kids are free labor. So you have a lot, you put, have as many as you can put up with, plus one, because that's how you find out it's too many. But with globalization, we all started to specialize. We started to industrialize because there were now interconnections around, among countries and economies that didn't exist before. And all of those industrial jobs were in town. So people moved from the farm to the city. And two generations on, here's where the Koreans are now. Wildly different economic models. In this system, kid rich, it's all about the consumption. 
people under 45, they do spending, they raise kids, they buy homes, they buy cars, they go to college. But they're relatively new, their experiences are low, their worker productivity is low. So you get a high inflation system driven by the consumption, a relatively low tax base, relatively low levels of education, relatively low levels of investment in technology. But when you age into this, lots of older workers who don't have kids, the savings are huge. You get a more technocratic system with a high tax base, a lot of social benefits. For a while. Because if you go, not just 10 years or 20 years, but 60 years without having very many children, you then get to a wall. And the Koreans will hit that this decade. This decade, that bulge ages into mass retirement. And when that happens, the Koreans will age into a system that is not driven by consumption or production or investment. And we have no clue what that will look like. But we're going to find out soon. All right, here are four systems that are worth chatting about. The top right, of course, or excuse me, top left, of course, is us. Now, our demographics are relatively different from the rest of the rich world for two reasons. Number one, globalization. It was bribe. We didn't invest our system in it. If we had, we would just be another empire. So we paid people to be on our side. We never internationalized our economic system. So our process of industrialization and urbanization has been much slower than most of the rest of the world. And then second, the U.S. has a lot of elbow room. So we've been able to move from farms to small towns to suburbs to cities. And those two steps in the middle have allowed our birth rate to remain higher for longer. You'll notice that it's pinched at the bottom. That will be a problem if we keep up on our current plan. By the time we get to, say, 2060, we may well be in a Korean-style situation. That's a lot of time for things to go wrong, but I prefer to think of it as a lot of time for things to go right. Mexico. Uh, the Mexicans had some issues with the Americans for a lot the last 150 years. You know, invading them will do that. And they never joined globalization. They didn't start to industrialize and urbanize in fury until NAFTA won in the early 90s. So they've got a pure pyramid until you get to the people who were born after NAFTA and then it goes straight down. Their birth rate has halved. They're on the same path as the rest of us. They just started later. A couple things that come from that. Number one, if they keep aging at their current rate, Mexico's going to have a really big problem demographically around 2080. It's a lot of time to figure some stuff out. Second, net migration from Mexico to the United States has now been flat to negative for 15 years because there aren't enough young people. They're staying home. Incomes have risen. The Mexicans don't have a reason to migrate. Most of the migrants that have been coming to, Me or to the United States have moved through Mexico, specifically from El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Central American countries, that's the bottom right. You'll notice it's the same shape as Mexico's. It just started the aging five to 10 years later. That's the Central American free trade agreement. So regardless of what you think about the southern border, keep two things in mind. Number one, Mexico is now a destination state for migrants. That changes the conversation. Second, Central Americans within 10 years are going to run out of people to send north. And this is going to look very, very different in the not too distant future. But for every Mexico, there's a dozen countries that look like Germany. This is their last decade. It's not that they run out of children, that happened 30 years ago. It's that this decade they run out of working aged adults. And they are not known for this world. If you want a Beamer, buy it now. Get 10 years of parts, you're gonna need those. All right, let's talk first about the least important generation. <laughs> it feels so good to be able to say that. The boomers have dominated everything about the United States since they burst upon the scene in the late 40s. And now, as of the fourth quarter of last year, half of them have retired. We are finally getting that watermelon through the snake. And it's glorious. They're not in charge anymore. It's delicious. However, we've got two big problems. First one, capital. Largest generation ever, 
They've been 55 and over. That's half of the private capital for the whole world, the American boomers. Half of them are already retired. They've already liquidated their savings. They're gone. It's not coming back, ever. Capital costs in the last three and a half years in this country have tripled. They're going to triple again in the next four years. This isn't the Fed. This isn't the business cycle. This is simply the baby boomers retiring and doing what retirees do with their money. We've known that this was coming since the last of them entered the workforce in the mid-60s. Are you ready? Yeah, no one is. Second, labor. Generations matter. Largest generation ever, largest workforce ever. Probably about a quarter of what we're feeling in the inflationary world right now is the boomers leaving the stage and never returning. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Next generation down, Gen X, this is my generation. We are, or were, part of the smallest generation in American history. And if we have a defining characteristic, it's just that we absolutely despise the baby boomers. They've ruined everything for us. But let's focus on one thing specifically that's relevant for this conversation, and that is family. When the boomers burst upon the scene between the late 60s and the early 80s, there were so many of them that they outcompeted one another for wages and pushed down the cost of labor for everyone. We've been living in that environment ever since. Labor costs in the United States have been artificially cheap for 50 years. It's part of our competitiveness. It became so bad that most boomer families felt that they needed the second spouse to enter the workforce as well, which only increased the labor supply more and pushed down prices even more. That gave the boomers the two characteristics that were very accurate. Number one, they're mobile. They will move for a job. They have no problem with that because it's desperation. And number two, the highest divorce rate we've ever seen because of the financial pressure that puts on the family unit. Gen X looks at that and we're like, no, sir. We will not make those mistakes. We will make different mistakes. But for us, our family is at least as important as our money. And so we are much more likely to be single income households, and we are much more likely to have durable marriages. But we have paid for that. Because we have been the low men and women on the totem pole our entire professional careers. We have seen the lowest increases in take home pay of any American worker generation ever. Until three years ago, when the boomers started to go away. And now, even if we all wanted to work, and we do not, <laughs> there would have never been enough of us to fill all those shoes. So we are now seeing the highest increases in take-home pay of any worker generation in American history. And we will continue to see that for at least another decade. Generation X, your time has finally arrived. The rest of you know this is labor inflation, but you can suck it. <laughs> All right, Zoomers, smallest generation we have ever had. And the single most important thing to remember about the Zoomer generation is that they are not, not, not millennials. The Boomers raised the millennials, and they were told that they were special, and they could live in the basement, and they can take five years to graduate from college, and go off to Germany to find yourself. We're not going to keep track of the score at the soccer game. Go get that art history degree. You be you. Oh, hell no. Gen X is like, social care, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, yeah, you're going to learn about those in history, because they're not going to exist. You want to get ahead? You have to be better. Not better than the millennials, that's easy. Better than everyone. You can rely on no one. You're gonna work your nose to the grindstone. We're gonna keep track of the soccer game scores. We're gonna write them down in a little book. We're gonna read it to you every night. And when you turn 17 and a half, get the hell out of my house. They're hard workers, pathologically so. They're the most medicated generation we've ever had because they have the highest suicide rate ever. They will follow you into hell if you are their employer, virtually. <laughs> You're the most antisocial generation we've ever had. 
Their dream job is to work in a closet that locks from the inside. <laughs> they don't do well in situations where they have to interface with another person or the sky. You need software generators, software engineers, they're perfect. You need anything physically moved? No. And they're also the smallest generation we've ever had in numbers. Between the exiting boomers, largest ever, and the entering zoomers, smallest number, last calendar year, we came up shy about 450,000 workers. That number is going to increase every year for the next 11 before it peaks at about 900,000. How do we know? They're all already here. If you don't like the American demographic structure, you need a time zone or time machine. You have to go back in time 30 years to fix it and have a lot of kids when you do it. This is just where we are. And then there's the millennials. We talked about some of the positives. Did we? Let's talk about some of the positives. Collaborative, cooperative, great at the touchy-feely management of skills. They're great with people, great in teams. All true, all backed by the data. They're also lazy and narcissistic. And they show up for the beginning of their work week at the crack of dawn on a Tuesday. Sorry, crack of noon on a Tuesday. The data supports both of those because there is no one millennial, there's two groups. The first group have always done everything we have demanded of them. They graduated from school in three and a half years. They didn't go out to find themselves. They went straight into the workforce. And because of it, they got screwed. They were the last ones in the door when the financial crisis hit in 08. So they were the first ones kicked out. Whether it's because they did everything right or everything wrong, the average American millennial has missed out on four years of work expertise in their 20s that they will never get back formative years. They're the least skilled generation for their age group we have ever had, and they will be behind until the day they retire. And yet, all of our hopes go with them anyway, because there's a lot of them. A large generation makes a large generation. The boomers made the millennials will make whatever's next. All we do, all we need to do is two things. One, wait. Because when the millennials age into their mid-50s, they are a large generation. They will fill out the capital structure in a way that my generation just can't. Two, we have to wait more. All we have to do is wait for their kids to grow up, get trained, and enter the workforce when they're in their 20s. Which means the capital structure will be ever tighter until the mid-2030s. And the labor market will be tighter until the mid-2040s. Higher, borrow, higher, borrow, higher, borrow. If you're going to remember nothing from my presentation, remember those two words. Because this is the cheapest that labor will be in 20 years and the cheapest that capital will be in 10. No pressure. Oh my God, they're so screwed. All right, putting up us and the Mexicans for comparison. This is the Chinese demographic. Uh, it is, by according to these data, uh, one of the five fastest aging societies in human history. And we now know this is wrong because about three months ago, the Chinese updated their data. And since 2017, they're now admitting to a 70% drop in their birth rate. That is faster than the decline in the birth rate suffered by the Jews during the Holocaust. Unprecedented in human history, even if you include wartime. And the Shanghai Academy of the Sciences, which is like their think tank that is supposed to interpret all the data, says that even this is now wrong. The Shanghai Academy estimates that they've overcounted their population by more than 100 million people with all of the missing millions being people who would have been born since the one-child policy was adopted 40 years ago, which is a sanitized way of saying that all of their missing millions are under age 40, suggesting that these yellow bars don't even exist. Assuming nothing else goes wrong, China has at most 10 years left 
as a unified, industrialized nation state. They're done. The question is whether they last 10 years or significantly less. My bet's less. They're not competitive anymore. This is average worker cost per month for a number of Southeast Asian countries that I'm pretty bullish on. Here are our Mexican neighbors right in the middle, hyper-competitive, and there's the Chinese. They've had a 14-fold 14, 14 increase in labor costs in the last 22 years, but labor productivity hasn't even tripled. In some sectors, some, it's quadrupled, but they haven't caught up with how much it costs. And now that there's not even a new generation coming up, it's only gonna get worse from here. Pretty much anyone who has reshored or friendshored manufacturing has discovered that they have a simpler supply chain with a lower cost structure than what they had when they were in China. This is vehicle sales in the Chinese space. Uh, when a country industrializes and urbanizes in the modern age, everybody's after the same four things in the same order. Smartphone, refrigerator, air conditioning unit, car, car sales. The dotted red line is the 12 month moving average. The blue bar is the beginning of COVID. You'll notice that the dotted red line not only has not recovered to pre-COVID levels, but it peaked a year and a half before COVID. One of the crazy things we're learning is that in the last five years, we've all been a little distracted. China went down the path of cult of personality. COVID muddled everybody's data and skewed everyone's perspective. And the Trump administration, well, I mean, that was like living inside of a bullhorn. We all missed a lot of the details of the world, especially in a place like China where information doesn't exactly flow freely. And so think of some of those big thresholds that you've heard about, China hitting in the last two years. Population starts to fall. India passes them. The United States average citizen is now younger than the average Chinese citizen. All those things have happened in the last few years. We're now discovering that it, what didn't happen in the last three years. Most of those happened a decade ago. It's not that China's at its peak or is about to hit its peak. Its peak was in the early 2010s, maybe even the late aughts. And we're only now starting to get a good look at the place. This is something that a really, really, really competent, even-handed government might be able to slow. I don't think they could reverse it, but they could slow it. That is not what we're seeing in China. Chairman Xi has created the tightest cult of personality in human history, more than Mao, more than Caligula. He has executed or imprisoned or exiled or intimidated to the silence everyone within the country who is capable of conscious thought to the degree that not only will people not speak power, truth to power, so many messengers have been shot that no one will speak to power at all. He is now the most isolated world leader ever. Quick war story, uh, Ukraine. You guys remember back in March of last year when Vladimir Putin was the one personally making the nuclear threats against the United States? The way it was explained to me when I was in Washington was that the Biden administration dispatched the ambassador with a simple message. And so the ambassador gets Putin alone in a room. He's like, Mr. Putin, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know here. But if I shine a light onto the facts from a slightly different angle, I'm hoping that it will get you to modify your behavior. So do you remember, Mr. Putin, back in January, when you were having all of your meetings in that safe room under the Kremlin? Uh, you know, the room where you have to go into a safe, into a safe, into a safe, so that there's no electronic monitoring. Uh, and no notes were taken, there were no minutes. And you decided the specific day that you were gonna pull the trigger for the war. You remember how when you left that safe that we had already published the minutes of that meeting in the international media. That was our subtle way as Americans of telling you that we know exactly where you are at any given moment. So if you think you can fling a few nukes into the Western Hemisphere, and the first half dozen we send back are going to go anywhere except directly up your ass, you're out of your mind. So stop it. And since then, Putin hasn't breathed a single nuclear threat. You see, Putin, for all his flaws, has an inner circle. He has people he speaks to. Information can theoretically at least make it to him. There are discussions which means there are phones to tap 
and emails to hack, and faxes to steal. There's a purchase for our intelligence system to capture information about the inner workings of the Kremlin. That doesn't exist for the Chinese, not because we can't hack into it. Actually, their information security is nothing compared to the Russians. But Xi speaks with no one. There is no inner circle. There are no conversations. And so we get a government in a box. The second most powerful economy on the planet is managed by one person who has insisted he's the only decision maker, but he's created a network where information cannot flow to him. And so that leaves the Chinese bureaucracy in a bit of a pickle, because they're trying to interpret their boss's wishes, and they have to do it third hand. And so we get data just vanishing because they think for whatever reason, it looks bad. So COVID deaths, they just stopped collecting the data. Uh, consumer confidence data. I don't know how you claim to have a consumption-led economy if you don't have consumer confidence data. Bond transactions. Data is not even collected anymore. How do you have a bond market? But the ones that worry me the more, college dissertations and political biographies of local officials. What Xi and the bureaucracy have done is made sure that there is no one under the age of 50 who can develop a reputation for competence and then rise up through the system. It's just Xi. But I think the best example that I can give you is that damn balloon. Now, I am not a balloon expert. Can you imagine that on a business card? Balloon expert. Neither is Joe Biden. I have the same response that Uncle Joe had when the balloon floated in from Canada. Thanks for that, by the way, Canada. Shoot it down. I mean, it's obviously a spy platform. It's 350 feet across. It was dangling something the size of an Embraer jet. You guys know Embraers? The jungle jets, like two seats on one side, one seat on the other, Barbie dream jet. Really, really cramped, really, really tiny. Unless it's dangling from a balloon, and then it's huge. So like, shoot it down, let's see what we got. But the United States, for all its flaws, does not have an information restriction problem like the Chinese system does. Somewhere in the annals, in the depths of the American security apparatus, there's some dude who is a balloon expert. And his report made it up to the top. And the Secretary of Defense and the Director of the CIA had a meeting with Biden, like, Mr. Biden, please don't shoot this thing down. We're not scared by it. We know exactly where it's going to go. It's going to float over the missile silos in Montana. But Mr. President, that's not a national security threat. Because unless you're planning on nuking someone in the next five days, they're going to, they're going to be closed. They're always closed. They're going to get pictures of closed hatches from seven miles away. whoop dee. But Mr. President, while this is not a national security threat, it is a national security opportunity. Because if we let this thing go on its merry way, we will put a spy helicopter below it and a spy plane above it, and we will train every whisper sensor we can on the thing. And we'll see the signals that as they come out. We will record their cryptography. We will trace the information flows through the satellite network and through our own civilian network. And at the end of this, we're gonna be able to tell you not what city, not what building, not what floor, not what office, what terminal is controlling this thing. And Mr. President, reminder, we have the best offensive hacking system on the planet. So we will tag all of the people who use that terminal and we will turn their entire system inside out. Mr. President, this is the intelligence bonanza of the decade and they handed it to us. So that's what we did. We now know from the after action that Chairman Xi wasn't even aware of the balloon until after it had been shot down. The information extremes are so strange. We now know that their military was unaware of it until it was over American airspace. It was just some asshat in an intelligence bureau thought, this is what wolf war diplomacy means, this is how you stick it to the Americans. This was the dumbest thing I have seen any country do in the last 20 years. And if you think back on the last 20 years, there's been a lot of competition for that coveted title. And we're seeing this sort of breakdown in decision-making and information flow in every part of the system, government, private, every sector, every bureau. This, to me, looks like the early stages of state collapse. 10 years? 
That's assuming that it's demographics that kills them. Sheer incompetence, especially if you're familiar with Chinese history, has killed a lot more governments in Beijing. Okay. Oh yeah, there's always the chance that there's going to be some shooting. Uh, you're looking here at an energy flows graphic. The green bars in the left on the west, those are net oil exports. The red bars on the east are net oil imports. You'll notice they're a convenient five to 9,000 miles apart. The flows of the tankers follow this route, the purple line that roughly hugs the coast. Now the Chinese do have a sizable navy, 600 ships versus our 300, but most of them would fit in this route. One at a time, not all at once, don't be dumb. They're small, they have very limited range. Something like 91% of their vessels can't sail more than 1,000 miles from shore, and that assumes they're going in a straight line and not dodging. If you actually go in war conditions, you're talking about maybe 400 miles. That's more than enough to interrupt that red line or that purple line, which means that if there's a conflict in the Persian Gulf, or there's an energy shortage because of events in Russia, which means there's not enough for anyone, or if the Japanese get persnickety, or if the Chinese make a Hail Mary for Taiwan, whatever it happens to be, we get a naval conflict, and the tankers redirect to this route, the deep sea route. It's an extra three to 4,000 miles long, but the Chinese can't reach it at all. If there's a hot war, China's done. You put two destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin, you cut the energy artery, and they import 80% of their energy and 80% of the inputs that allow them to grow their own food. They have a deindustrialization collapse and a famine that kills half their population within two years. Five years ago, they knew this. She knew this. But five years of eating nothing but propaganda? It's not clear what it does to your brain. And there's no one's phones to tap to find out what he's thinking now. Okay, let's talk capital. This is the private credit curve. This is all money from all sources to all destinations in the United States. You want to charge a stick of gum? You want to buy an aircraft carrier battle group. It's all here. It's everything except overnight lending. So the discount window, that's not here. But interbank lending, no, 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 everything else. From 2000, at the start of the data, to that bump in the middle, that's the subprime build. We doubled total private credit in this country in seven years. That was too much, too fast. We had an adjustment, a recession, that knocked 5% off of headline GDP. Doubling, seven years, too much, 5% recession. That's our baseline. Same data, different scale. Doubling is that bump in the middle. Here is Canada. Do we have any Canadians here? We're pretty close to the frontier. One. Wow, security here is pretty good. I'll take a good take. <laughs> okay, from 2000 to 2007, I would argue that the Canadians had the healthiest banking sector on the planet. Good safeguards, good senses of how to manage risk. And then we had the Great Recession. And the Canadians did something that was very Canadian. Like, Americans just had the worst recession ever. We can totally have a worse recession. And they dismantled every safety on their entire banking sector and doubled and tripled down on every mistake that we had made. And credit boomed. They got to 2014 and they're like, oh, maybe we don't want to win this one. And they dialed it back. I would argue they're not out of the woods yet, but it's much better than it was nine years ago. Here's Germany. You want to get a house in Germany? You don't get your 20% together and go to the bank for the loan for the other 80. You go to the bank and they're like, okay, that's great. You want a house, okay? What you do is you give us right now a deposit of the volume that you expect your mortgage payment to be monthly. And then you do that again next month and the month after and the month after and the month after and the month for 60 months. Then once you've proven you're not at credit risk, you get a loan. There are many problems in the German system today. Financial overextension is not among them. But oh wow, Greece. Sevenfold increase of credit. So far, they've knocked 55% off of their GDP. They probably are going down more, but COVID hit and the numbers got out of squirrel. Here is Australia. One of the great things about the American system is that for us, most financial regulation happens at the national level, which allows for a relatively coordinated response. So when the subprime crisis got really bad in August of 07, uh, Sheila Baer 
of the uh, FDIC got together with Paulson from Treasury and Bernanke from the Fed. They crowded around a two-top in Washington and basically hacked out what would eventually be known as TARP, the restitution program that we used to put a floor under the crisis and set the stage for recovery. The Australians did something very similar. But the big difference is that we Americans did something that was very American. Someone had to be holding the bag. So if you had made a bad investment decision, either as a bank granting loans or as a private person getting a loan that you probably shouldn't have qualified for, you were left with some of the financial loss. There was a price to pay. Not in Australia. In Australia, they provided full funding to cover all mortgages. And if you could prove that you could service your mortgage with a 100% government guarantee, you automatically qualified for a second mortgage, and a third, and a fourth. Their subprime bubble has not yet popped, and it has only gotten bigger. The green is Brazil, you know, we're all dreading a redux of Biden versus Trump. The Brazilians are like, oh, we've already been through that. <laughs> About seven years ago, they had a race between two people. One was campaigning from prison, where he had been convicted of corruption. Not indicted, convicted. And he was running against a dude who said that the real problem with those Nazis is they were just too soft on their domestic opponents. The Nazi lover won the first round. The guy in prison were, were won the second time around. Lost decade? Best case scenario, probably two lost decades. Here's India. It's almost the same policy, carbon copy from Australia, but in order to qualify for the credit, you had to be a friend of the prime minister. Here's China. Are you fucking kidding me? On a good day, the Chinese economy is a badly run in a row. This is going to explode or implode. The only question is how soon? 10 years, the demographic crash, best case scenario. All right, uh, let's talk about impacts. Uh, things I'm not worried about. Goods exports from the rest of the world to China. They only make up about 3.5% of GDP, which is the lowest percentage of any country on the planet. The Chinese have a very protectionist system. Anything that they can make, they do, even if the quality is subpar. So that's not nothing, 3.5% of GDP for the world's second largest economy, but it's manageable. I'm also not worried about banking. When the Ukraine war started, every Western financial institution liquidated their entire position in the Russian financial sector. All of it, zero. The Chinese rushed into that space. And so those Western financial institutions like, whoa, that just smells like the next round of sanctions. So we'd better cut our position in Chinese holdings as well. You take the total combined exposure of all Western banks to all Chinese finance, it's less than 1% of global holdings. It's already been taken care of. Commodities, of course, are different. This is the world's largest importer of pretty much anything that is a commodity, whether it's food or otherwise. For the food, keep in mind that the last thing a government does before it collapses is interferes with, with the food shipments in some way. That'll last to the end, and then it's going to fall off a cliff. Commodities are more muddled. The Chinese, because of that debt situation, build a lot of things that they don't need or don't use. Probably the best example I can give you, of course, is housing. Shanghai Academy of Sciences, remember those guys? They estimate now that somewhere between, or um, they estimate there's, there's surplus housing in China from their housing build to put up somewhere between 1.5 and 3 billion people. That's a lot of apartments. So when you look at the $35 trillion of sunk cost in the Chinese industrial sector, we probably don't need to rebuild all of that, but a lot of it. This is where we're gonna feel it. This is some data from the American Enterprise Institute. Those yellow bars show the average inflation for the last 22 years, 74.4%. Everything that's below that 
has gotten relatively cheaper in real terms, and everything above it has gotten more expensive. And I'm oversimplifying here, but if it's above the line, it's something that requires fingers and eyes, people, healthcare, for example. And if it's something that's below that line, you plug it into a wall and it beeps. It's a manufactured good. The Chinese hyper-subsidization of the entire system has created this bevy of cheap manufactured goods that have kept inflation down throughout the world for 25 years. That is where we're going to feel it. That has to be done somewhere else. And that's probably gonna cost more because we're not gonna subsidize it to the degree that the Chinese have. We're working on that. This is industrial spending on construction, basically building that new industrial plant that we need so desperately. The blue line is the courtesy of the Shell Revolution. We have the world's largest production of high quality oil and of natural gas at the lowest production costs of any player in the world. And so we have tripled to quadrupled industrial spending and building up the processing capacity. So chemical plants, refineries. Here are the other categories and here is computing and electronics. Right, right there. That's when the CHIPS Act and the IRA passed. You'll notice it had already gone up by a factor of five before. So this isn't just government activity. This is all us kind of instinctually recognizing that we really need to triple down on this as quickly as possible. And we need that kind of increase in spending in every manufacturing subsector moving forward. My biggest concern for the Chinese situation isn't that they're not going to die. It's that when they die, the information exchange is going to be so limited that we're not going to realize that they died until the product stops arriving. And if we have to do this transition without Chinese equipment to help build out the plant, that's going to be a real problem. The sooner we start, the better. On this stuff, we started yesterday. That's great. All right, uh, more millennials. Okay. Every sector is going to feel the changes from these shifts, but I think the one that I'm most concerned about is technology in general, because the, it's not a China situation. It's a demographic situation. If you want to push the technological envelope, you need a large group of young people who can imagine the future, who can develop an operational plan for creating the technology, build the operationalization, take it to mass manufacturing. But that entire process doesn't earn you any income. The income only comes after production. Well, those young people, we used to call them millennials. The oldest millennial turns 44 this year. They're this close from their midlife crises, which is going to be delicious. <laughs> but it also means that they've aged out, and the next generation is too small to do this at scale. And then the capital, the baby boomers have aged out, and they've taken their money with them. So the macroeconomic environment that we've had for the last 20 years, it's just, it's just not there anymore. And the soonest we can get back to that pace of advancement is going to be 2045. That's gonna make it really difficult to use things like automation to make this all work. We have to have people, and there aren't enough of them. Automation is one of the most capital intensive things a country can do. Because it's not just an issue of designing and implementing it. Keeping it updated is actually more expensive than installing it in the first place. And that takes capital we arguably don't have. And then of course, even if that works perfectly, that only solves the production side of the equation because robots don't consume them yet. All right, you are here, in case anyone like tied it on last night. This is the most important city in the history of human civilization. This is Marshalltown, Iowa, where I'm from. This is Bismarck, North Dakota. Should you find yourself in Bismarck, you're gonna to have to ask yourself the very serious question, why? And this is not a frat party. It's the back and shale field in Western North Dakota, population four. It's lit up because of a problem with transport. Oil's a liquid. It conforms to the shape of its container. You can put it into a tanker truck or a rail car or whatever. But natural gas is a gas and it disperses. 
and it can take upwards of nine months to build out the collection infrastructure to put it into a pipe system. And in the meantime, you have to flare it. You can see those flares from space. Which means in the United States, only in the United States, natural gas has been priced primarily as a waste product for the last decade. And that changes almost everything. Here's the pricing structure. This is Henry Hub down in Oklahoma. This is our primary natural gas pricing facility. These are hurricanes. Because it used to be pre-shale, most of our natural gas came from the offshore Gulf of Mexico. Storm would come through, they'd shut down the rig, they'd evacuate it, storm would do its damage, they'd come out the next day and they would spend weeks, if not months, repairing the damage, and you would get an elevated price environment until that was fixed. Until 2009, because that's the year that the majority of the natural gas consumed on this continent came from shale fields, with the majority of that being a byproduct. And so we got this nice, long stretch of really cheap natural gas. Now that period ended in February of 21. Do we have any Texans here? They know what I'm talking about here. One Texan. You remember what happened in February 21? It got cold in Texas. It got down to 25. And they lost their minds. Everything broke. Wind, solar, natural gas, oil, nuclear, coal. How does coal break down? Manage it in Texas. And here's the Ukraine war. Now remember, waste economics pricing. Here's Asia and Europe. We're at the beginning of a new age where we get wobbles in energy prices in the United States and where everywhere else shit gets very real very fast. Germany's BASF, their chemical super major, is in the process of physically dismantling their biggest facilities and shipping them to Louisiana because they know they will never have natural gas at a price point that allows them to be competitive ever again. Their hope is that they can get it all set up here to tap the shale gas market and that the chemicals that they use, they can then ship home to try to save their economic model. That's as good as it gets for the Europeans. It's probably not gonna work. Okay, let's talk manufacturing. I love good matrix. If you're at the top, you don't know who your third tier supplier is, much less your 13th. If you're at the bottom, you can probably fit your entire supply chain on the back of a cocktail napkin, even after throwing back a couple of bourbons. If you're on the right, your system is already based on the NAFTA network. And if you're on the left, you're dependent upon the Chinese. A couple examples. American workers, American capital, American midstream, American processing, American consumers. Pretty straightforward. The opposite of straightforward. The iPhone has 1,400 manufacturing supply chain steps, 91% of which involve mainland China in some way. The new iPhone just dropped earlier this month. If you're an Apple fan, I suggest you get two. This is probably the last model for a while. Here's everybody else. I'm gonna go through a few of these that are a little bit more relevant to you guys. First of all, chemicals. Because of the shale revolution, we are now the world's largest producer of the refined chemicals that form the, ba the backbone of any industrial supply chain, whether it's plastics or diapers. Which means that when we wanna go into medium manufacturing now, the raw materials are already here, ready to be used. That is an advantage that I don't think most people recognize yet, but we're gonna to come to really appreciate over the next several months. Automotive, courtesy of NAFTA 2. I mean, there's not a lot of things about Donald Trump that I was a fan of. NAFTA 2, I thought, was very well done. And 80% of the supply chain steps for automotive are already located within the continent. The Asian manufacturers are racing to catch up by building more stuff here. The Europeans never started. Again, if you want a Beamer, now's the time. Heavy vehicles are different. You use a lot of the same equipment and skill sets to make a forklift that you use to make a truck. But not everyone wants a forklift. And so that construction tends to be relatively concentrated. And the more concentrated an industry happens to be, the easier it is for a government to put its finger on the scale of subsidies and locate it to their home. And that's exactly what the Chinese have done in this space. So if you want mining equipment, or if you want construction equipment, you better get your orders filled right now because there's gonna be a gap 
of two to three years when the Chinese go offline, that we're just not going to be able to get new stuff at scale. Farming equipment is pretty much okay. You guys build that here yourselves. Electronics, this is where I'm most worried. Electronic supply chains are the most varied in the world because the things that go into it are so varied. So you've got die cast and injection molding, but then you've got soldering and plastics, and you've got wirings and coatings, and then you've got microchips and motherboards, and then you've got software and programming. All of that is done by different people with different skill sets at different price points. And the reason the Asians are so good at this space is you've got unskilled labor in Indonesia, you do assembly in China, you do the motherboard assembly in Thailand, you do the design in Japan, you build the motherboards in Korea. Everyone does a different thing, and under globalization, everyone's on the same side. There's not a security problem. You, all the intermediate parts flow back and forth and back and forth. We don't have that labor structure here. We have two price points, Canada and the United States and Mexico, and that's it. I am very concerned for how we're going to do all of this. I do have a little bit of hope, though, that came from the strangest place. Textiles, of all things. If you remember way back when, in 1992, all of our textiles in this country were made in the Appalachian states. And it was all the same model. Women with sewing machines, doing it by hand. Then, in 1992, NAFTA was ratified, and all of those jobs moved to Mexico. Same model, women with sewing machines. And then in 2001, China and India got into the World Trade Organization, and all of those things moved down to India and China. Same model, women with sewing machines. And then COVID happened, and suddenly we had no clothes. So some enterprising folks in North Carolina set up some automated systems. One acre facilities with a staff of two. One software engineer, one mechanic. And these facilities take raw cotton, clean it, process it into thread, weave it into yarn, sew it into cloth, cut it into panels, assemble it into clothes. Staff of two. And the end product as at a lower price point than what the Bangladeshis do with unskilled labor. In the last 50 years, the technology had advanced, and we didn't realize it because no one had a need to apply it. So we're probably going to find a lot of pleasant surprises as we do this. Probably won't work all as well as textiles, but this isn't necessarily a doomsday situation. We're just going to have to build all ourselves still. All right, what's next? Oh, semiconductors. This is crazy. Okay. There's three different kinds of semiconductors, just big buckets. You've got your relatively dumb ones, your near analog chips. They're 90 nanometers and bigger. This is what is in your refrigerator. This is in your singing margarita machine, the Internet of Things. Then you have your middle quality, 90 nanometers to 10. This is the bulk of what we have. This is satellite communications and cell towers and most phones, not iPhones, but most phones. Uh, automotive aerospace. And then you've got your really good chips, your 10 nanometer and smaller. This is electric vehicles and AI and smart meters at your house, power regulation. The stuff on the bottom part, the dumb chips, 80% of those are from China, we're going to lose those. I'd argue two things. Number one, we can do without the Internet of Things. We don't need a back scratcher that Dances. And it's not exactly advanced tech, so that can be rebuilt fairly easily. On the high end, those great semiconductors that are cutting edge, that's a real problem too. Now, about 92% of those are fab fabricated in Taiwan, but that's the right word, fabricated. The facilities that do the manufacturing, the Taiwanese can't build them themselves. They tap a constellation of over 9,000 companies in 60 different countries. And half of those companies produce one product for one end user, and they have no international competition. They've been working on it for 40 years. They're the only place where that skill set exists. And so if a single country falls out of the globalized constellation, we lose all of the high-end semiconductors until such time as that constellation can be rebuilt somewhere else. This is AI. 
I think all these conversations we're having about the threats of AI, the ethical complications, the impact on the workforce, I think these are great conversations. But I also think we have about an extra 10 years to figure it all out because we're not gonna be able to be produce the chips. Stuff in the middle, that's a really robust ecosystem. They come out of a dozen different countries. There's competition, there's redundancy. So most of what we use that matters, I think we're fine. But the high end and the low end, I love this slide. This is inflation. Everybody fun about inflation? Okay. We're all the way over here. I'm not overly concerned for the moment uh, because most of the inflation, I'd say three quarters of it has to do with COVID. Every time we got a new vaccine or a new variant or a new policy or the anti-vaxxers threw a fit or the hypochondriacs got in charge of policy, every time something changed, we changed what we consume. And it takes about 18 months for changes in demand to ripple through the industrial supply chain system. Well, if you think back to about two years ago, Florida, Texas, and Arizona reopened for the last time. Everyone else followed over the next six months, and then finally, nine months later, the Californians joined in as well. It's been a year and a half. And so supply chains have mostly gotten back to normal, and inflation has been trending down for months. Biden doesn't deserve very much blame for making inflation high, and he certainly doesn't deserve very much credit for bringing it back down. This was us. That's not what I'm worried about. To understand what I'm worried about, we have to go back a little bit. There have been three big phases of inflation in the post-war environment. First, we had that initial burst of inflation from industrialization and urbanization. We built our cities. We had industrial demand-driven inflation. Then the baby boomers came of age and they built their homes and raised their kids and we had consumer demand-driven inflation. And of late, we've been living in this weird-ass period. The Chinese bellied up to the bar with a billion industrial workers pushing down the cost of finished goods for everybody. And the Soviet system collapsed and poured an empire worth of raw materials on the world, putting downward pressure on commodity prices. For 30 years, it's been a great time. Well, those disinflationary trends are going away. The Russian materials are vanishing. Chinese labor is literally dying. And those inflationary trends are back. Because while the boomers may have exited stage left, their kids, the millennials, are at the peak of their consumption years and will be for 10 years to come. And if we still want stuff in a post-Chinese situation, we're gonna have to build it ourselves. We need to double the size of the industrial plant on this continent, and we need to do it in the next six years. And that will generate inflation in the range of 9 to 15 percent. Now, before you have a stroke or call your broker, deep breath. Double the size of the industrial plant. That means producing locally with local workers to solve, serve local consumers. Building out a system that makes us largely immune to international shocks, a system that uses less water and less energy and less capital. This isn't a good story. This is a great story. This is going to generate the fastest economic growth in the history of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. It's just that it's not a straight line. Okay, how are we feeling? I have no idea how long I've been up here. <laughs> you guys want to go to Q&A you want me to keep going? Just keep going. Okay, you want to talk about something that's like two orders of magnitude more important than what's going on in Gaza? This is it. This is the Russian space. It's tilted on its side, so north is that way. On the right, we've got a population density map. The lighter color of orange is the same population density as Wisconsin if you remove everything south of the shield. So just like country. No Oshkosh, no Green Bay, no Madison, no Milwaukee. Whatever's left, that's the light orange. So, so you know your neighbor's name, but you've forgotten the details of their lives and you don't care. On the left, you've got a combined economic map with a combined climate map. So the green, that's where everybody lives. That's the wheat belt, that's the part worth having. 
The blue is tundra and tegai, the yellow is desert, completely empty. What drives the Russians to binge drink is the gray on the edges. Territories that are even worthless by Russian standards, but are flat and you can totally run a Mongol horde through those. Russia's been invaded 50 odd times in their history. And the only way the Russians have ever discovered that they can prevent those invasions are to expand past the gray into these zones where you can't put a tank. Mountains, deserts, waterways. And then forward position their military in the access points between them. If they can do that, if they can plug the gaps, then they can prevent the war from ever happening in the first place. That has been their strategy for 400 years. They achieved success in that strategy in World War II under Stalin. And then in the post-Cold War collapse, they lost control of all but two of those spots. And everything that they have done since then is about reestablishing boots on the ground on those access points. Ukraine is their ninth war since 1991 to do this. If they succeed in Ukraine, that doesn't help them directly, but it puts them within arm's reach of the two most important of those gaps, one in Romania, one in Poland. So we know as much as we know anything that if they are successful, this is just the next step. And that's a problem. Because we discovered in the first month of the war that we were wrong about a lot of things. You guys remember the first week when that 40 mile long convoy of military vehicles was going south from Belarus to Kiev? And that convoy had more firepower than the entirety of the Ukrainian military at the moment. And we're like, is this already over on day three? And then on day four, the convoy stopped because they forgot fuel. And on day seven, all the soldiers got out of their equipment and walked back to Belarus because they also forgot food. We discovered that the Russians not only don't know how to launch a modern war, but any war. It's not an army, it's a mob with guns. And that made no one happy in the defense bureaus of the world. Because as much as we know anything, the Russians see Ukraine as a stepping stone to the next war, the bigger war. And we now know that if they are successful in Ukraine and they hit the NATO border and they go for Warsaw, which has always been the goal, and they have not been shy about talking about that, well, we'll come up against NATO forces which are the best in the world, led by the Americans. And we will have a clash that will utterly obliterate the conventional Russian forces. It'll be a bloodbath, it'll be a thousand to one casualty ratio. And the only card they will have left to play is nukes. So the decision was made in Washington and London and Berlin and Stockholm and the rest very early that any weapon system that the Ukrainians can prove that they can operate competently and maintain. The Germans were very clear on that. A weapon system you cannot maintain is not a weapon system. And they are right. But anything they can prove that they can operate and maintain, they can have. Everything else is details. There's a lot of details. But that's been the understanding we've been operating from since the second month of the war. That's what is it's at stake here. If we fail here, we will lose Paris and Chicago. And that makes the math on everything else really, really simple. It also means we need to prepare for a world that's post-Russia as well as post-China. This is Siberia. It's permafrost. The Canadian knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> permafrost, somewhere between 10 and 30 feet below the surface, you hit a layer that's cold enough that it never thaws but the top layer is very dynamic and turns into horizon swamping, a horizon-spanning swamp every single summer. If you want to produce something in this zone, you wait for it to freeze, you build a berm hundreds of miles out into the permafrost, and then you run your pipe, your rail, your road, whatever it happens to be down the spine of that berm, and then you build a drilling platform and drill while it's frozen. It's the highest upfront production cost of any country in the world, but it's a dynamic landscape. So if an aquifer cracks open, everything slides to the side. Or maybe the aquifer drains down, in which case you get a sinkhole. Or maybe there's no aquifer at all, and you just have an extra warm summer, and some of the rotting vegetation that's locked in the permafrost has a chance to actually rot a little bit more, in which case you get a methane bubble. This is all really bad for infrastructure. 
And so the Russians have the highest maintenance cost for their industrial plant in their production zones of any country in the world. Problem is, the Russian population faced a series of collapses in the post-Cold War environment, and their educational system broke before the Soviet Union even fell back in 85. So the youngest cadre of Russian engineers who actually know what they're doing, they turned 64 this year. They have a much worse skilled labor problem than anyone else, certainly worse than here. And so they have relied upon foreigners to do this work on the front end and the back end. It's been Americans, Germans, and Dutch for the most part, until sanctions start and it all stopped. I don't know how long they can keep this running. A month? A year? Ten? Don't know. But I can tell you it's all ultimately going to go away. And we need to prepare for that. All right, let me take a big steaming dump on the green transition. <laughs> I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but with conventional energy, it's really not that complicated. You light a match, you start something on fire, you capture the heat in some way. That's, that's all it is. You can dress it up and make it fancy. That's really the core idea. That's not how it works with green tech. You need an order of magnitude more materials and different materials in order to generate the electricity to transmit it and especially to store it. You can kind of see that here. The top is what goes into your, your electric vehicle and the bottom is what goes into your internal combustion engine vehicle. And same basic concept for power generation. You have green tech, with solar and wind at the top, conventional thermal at the bottom. If we are serious about doing what we say we want to do for the green transition, we need two to three times much, as much copper, 10 times as much nickel, 14 times as much chromium, 18 times as much graphite, 20 times as much lithium, and on and on and on. And our species has never in our history doubled the volume of an industrial material that was already in use in a 10-year period. And we're now going to do that with 20 of them? No. Not physically possible. Oh yeah. And those are the materials where the Russians are a top three user or producer, so we have to do without that as well. Can not happen. Probably. Every era is where one of those materials is produced in bulk. If we were to use our military, which is no longer deployed, it's had three years to rest and recoup from the war on terror, rearm, recruit, it's ready to go. If we were to send it out in the world and conquer all of those eras, all of them, and run a Belgian-style extraction empire and bring all of the stuff back here, then there would be enough for us, but no one else. This is not a recommendation. <laughs> Just to do what we say we want to do, this is the only way to make it work. And even that's not enough, because lithium ore is useless. You've got to turn it into concentrate and then turn it into metal. Then you can start making batteries. All the processing and the red bars, that's China and Russia. So in addition for us needing to double the size of the industrial plant, we need to build a processing process. Now, it took us 45 years to do that for oil and gas. How long do you think it's going to take to do it for this stuff? It's not that it's technically difficult. It just takes time and money. And money is a problem. This is the full cycle cost for a combined cycle natural gas plant. And those are what provide natural gas based electricity to roughly 40% of the American pop population. Single largest source we've got. It's color coded based on where the cost comes from. The blue is the cost of installing it in the first place, building the facility, building the transformers. The gray, that's the cost of the fuel over the full life cycle of the plant. And this is a model we're familiar with. It's a subscription model. You pay as you go, which means you only have to finance the blue wedge. Here's the same data, but for wind. There's no fuel. That's part of the attraction of wind and solar. But that means that all of the cost is up front. Capital costs have tripled in the last three and a half years. They're going to triple again in the next four. The economic model for this doesn't work anymore. There just isn't enough capital. 
we can't make this work, at least not with today's technology. The smart play, sorry, the smart play would be for us to focus where it works the best. Solar panels in the Southwest, wind turbines in the Great Plains, and then run transmission lines to where we actually live. Make the most out of every worker and every dollar. That's the smart play. We're not gonna do that because of politics. If you're at the top, you want the government out of your personal life. If you're at the bottom, you think the government should play some sort of role in protecting social norms. If you're on the left, you want the government to in people's wallets to get the resources they need to remake society. And if you're on the right, you want the government out of your wallet completely. And you can combine these. So for example, if you're in the bottom right, a social and an economic conservative, uh, you oppose food stamps on principle because famine builds character. Really? In the, in the Midwest, that doesn't bring the house down? Wow, <laughs> tough crowd. If you're at the top left, an economic and a social liberal, you look forward to the glorious day when we're all dancing around the fire, singing Kumbaya, wearing gunny sack clothing that was paid for by the confiscation of all private property. That's one of those crowds, got it, okay. Here are our traditional political factions. The Reds are our traditional Republicans. The Blues are the Democratic Alliance, and the Greens are traditionally swing groups. The single biggest impact that Donald Trump had was he elevated a faction from the fringes to the core. The populists are made up of a group of people who most of them hadn't voted in the last four elections. And he brought them in from the cold, and they got a taste of power, and they are not going anywhere. But in elevating them, that caused fissures within the Republican coalition that alienated some of the core factions that had run the party for the last 70 years. And so Trump got rid of them. He ejected them from his administration. He drove them out of the Republican Party national apparatus and at the local level. And he actively campaigned against their champions in Congress. They are no longer Republicans. For those of you who wonder if you've left your party, no, you did not leave your party. Your party left you, and you're a swing voter now. But Trump was able to reach out and draw in other groups that were closer to his social conservative core, and that changed the electoral map. This is what the Republican Party is today. It's a dense group with a lot in common but it doesn't have the numbers to win unless something really dramatic happens. Now, there are a million lessons to be drawn from here. Let me focus on three. Number one, unions. There's swing voters now. That feels weird. We need to double the size of the industrial plants in this country in an environment of labor shortages. How many of those industrial jobs do you think are gonna be blue collar? We're at the dawn of the greatest period of organized labor in American history. Their political power will rise with it. There's a reason why Trump and Biden were both in Detroit last week to try to garner support. This is the single largest pool of unclaimed voters in the system at the moment. The business community are also swing voters now. And this is just crazy. The unions and the business community have been on either sides of the political aisle for the last century and a half. And their debates, their arguments, their discussions, their compromises, that is American economic policy. And for the first time in a century and a half, neither of them are even in the room. If you've been looking at the Biden administration or the Trump administration's economic policies and it just seems wackadoo, that's because it is wackadoo. No one who can do math is in the room. But there's a faction that fancies themselves capable of doing math. <laughs> and for a group that says they're science-based, wow, they're bad at math. But they're in the room. And so, whether it's MAGA or the Greens, they're a little offended if you bring a fact-based study to them. Because MAGA has run against the concept of competence in that industry, and the Greens just think they've been lying for the last century. And so we're getting very, very strange economic policy out of it. 
which means that even though we don't have the materials, even though we don't have the capital to labor, we're going to be pushing the green transition past all bounds of sanity for the next several years, until such time as the unions, the business community, or both, end up in one faction or the other. And then we once again have people in the room who can do math. Then we might get something that makes a little bit more sense. But not until then. All right, I'm done. Okay, um, if you're looking for more information on this and other topics, the QR code on the left will take you to the newsletter. It is free. I will never share your data with anyone. If you happen to see something like, oh yeah, I totally would have paid for that, uh, whatever you would have paid, give to the QR code on the right. That's MedShare. MedShare is a charity that provides medical assistance to communities who, through no fault of their own, have lost the ability to look out for themselves. So, for example, if the Russians are bombing your power grid, MedShare will step in and help with diesel generators and fuel, and that link goes directly to the Ukraine page. How are we feeling? you want to ask in front of the class, now's the time, but I will be here for the mingling afterwards as well. And Teresa and Kathy have uh, microphones, they don't come to you. Hi, Peter. Nope. Hi. Oh, sorry. We'll probably try to edit it through. Your call. Go ahead. Peter, one of the things I, I, I'd like you to talk to us about is you, you went through the demographics to China, the cult of personality, and all that stuff, but still today, you're hearing our politicians talk about, it's almost as if Xi is the new stop. They're, they're, and this, so they're, you know, the China's buying all of our debt. China's buying everything here. China's buying every uh, shipping port. China is doing this, China is doing that. And, it, and as recently as a month ago, I heard David Rubenstein, the chairman of Carlisle Groups, repeat something I've heard many, many times, which is that China, in the next several years is going to eclipse us in GDP. Sure. And obviously that's not your sentiment, but where are these people, how, is, how are they coming? These are, he, by Gruden Center, and he's not, he's no dummy, right? So where is, where are, where are they coming from? Well, let me give two things. No, number one, which is a logical fallacy that a lot of people fall for. For the last 20 years, this has been the average growth rate. So it's gonna be the same growth rate for the next 20 years. What they forget is the last, 20, especially the last 40 years, has been a one-off event, moving from the countryside to the city, industrializing. You only do that once. And they concentrate it into a single generation. The kicker is, by compressing it, yes, you do get higher growth rate during that period, but you'd never get any of the ancillary stuff and the education and the sophistication and the technology that goes with it. So we've done this over 10 generations. And if you look at the growth of the last 10 generations, We've expanded our economy at roughly a factor of 350. The Chinese have done it in 40 years, yes, and that's impressive, and the annual growth rates are certainly higher, but their collective growth is less than half of ours, and now they're left with a demographic that's inverted. So the fallacy doesn't take into account the fact that you can only do this once, and they've shot everything they've got in order to get to this point. Second problem. Without globalization, nothing in China works. They import all the raw materials, they export all the finished goods. That doesn't work without the US Navy making it safe for them. So if we ever do have a real breach in the relationship, China's done the next day. And they have famine within a year. And another reason. Oh yeah, Americans aren't happy unless we're really stressed out about something. <laughs> The greatest red scare we had was in 1985, when this guy named Gorbachev took over. And even though Gorbachev came in with the intent of ending the Cold War peacefully, we were convinced that the end was very nigh. This is just who we are. And it's part of the reason why I'm a little worried that we're not gonna realize China's gone until it's too late. Uh, and I will never, ever, ever, tell our military to not prepare for a fight. And China is the obvious candidate for the other side. I would just like to see us spend 1% of the effort that we spend preparing for a fight to prepare for what happens the day after China ends. Because we failed to do that for the Soviet period. And we are still cleaning up that mess. Iran, 
North Korea, China, 9-11, these are all things that are indelibly linked to the Soviet collapse. So, you know, chin up, we'll be okay, but maybe plan for tomorrow instead of for a fight. So, uh, Peter, thank you very much. And, you know, you covered a wealth of information. You said the math doesn't work. One of the things that uh, I would just be kind of curious is the acceleration of death in the United States. You know, over a 30-day period, it's increased a half a trillion dollars on par to go another trillion and a half. At what point in time do we have a moderate risk of sure. us being greased on a grand scale? Okay, three things. Number one, I should be very clear about this, the debt is a bipartisan achievement. <laughs> Started under Johnson and Nixon, increased massively under Carter and Reagan, got huge under W. Obama comes in, says, hold my beer. Trump is like, biggest deficit ever. I can have a deficit that's more huge. And then of course Biden comes in, his story is not yet done, but with every step, the pace of increase has gotten bigger. So you can't blame this on the other side of the aisle no matter who you are. So that's number one. Number two, I'm a fiscal conservative. I really hate saying this, but it really doesn't matter. As long as we are the only currency on the planet that is globalized, we have options that no other power in history has ever had. And that means we can run the Reading a lot. I don't, I'm not happy saying this, but if you just look at our average growth rate, 3%, roughly. 3% of American GDP is about $800 billion. So the first $800 billion of deficit spending every year is kind of free. It doesn't increase the overall debt load. And once you get past that, you get the fact that we're the global trade currency and the global store of value. If there was a competitor, I'd probably be a little bit concerned, but the Europeans confiscated insured bank deposits 15 years ago to pay for their bailouts, and so everyone liquidated their euro positions. Every once in a while, the Chinese opened their current account to allow a little bit more money flow, and within six months, on average, you get over a trillion in savings from the Chinese people just to get out. They'll take whatever they can get, and then they slam it shut. It's shut right now. And I think the best thing I can give you is the, uh, the BRICS summit that happened a couple months ago. Uh, everyone was talking about de-dollarization. Everyone here is still talking about de-dollarization. But as they arrived, the Chinese, the South Africans, and the Indians all said they had no interest in a non-US dollar-driven system. It wasn't really reported because that didn't mesh with the panic in the financial world here. But the only country in the world that really wants something besides the dollar is Russia, and they just want everyone to use the ruble. Well, that's not going to happen. So I, I don't see this going anywhere, but I also don't see it being a real critical problem. And I really am not comfortable saying that, but that's where we are. Oh, one more thing. Um, third, Japan. Japan's the most indebted country in human history. 550% of GDP once you include the pensions and arrears. Is anyone really worried about a financial run in Japan? And they're not even the global currency. So we know we can get at least to three and a half times where we are today, probably four and a half times, before we hit the theoretical danger zone of a non-hard currency. There's a lot of wiggle room. Peter. Hello, Peter. Hi. Pulling on that thread a little further, uh, there's two brothers out on the Visage uh, circuit calling for a Great uh, Depression in 2030. It will last till 2035. The Mandalu brothers? Maybe. Yeah, I've spoken back to back with them, both of them, and you know, twins, weird. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I was curious uh, if you agreed with... No. Okay. Well, I mean, the core idea that at some point we're going to have a big adjustment for reasons demographic and financial, I buy the idea. Uh, the idea it's going to be in a specific time frame, I don't, because there's so many other moving parts here. And the idea that it's going to be focused in the United States and spread to the rest of the world, I don't think fits either, because our demographics are better, our finances for all other issues are better, the pathway is better, the growth story is better. So what I would expect, and I've not thought about this a lot, is if we're going to have this six-year massive industrial build-out at a time when a lot of other power centers in the world are breaking down, we're going to have record growth and record inward financial flight, capital flight, which is going to distort a lot of things in a lot of weird directions. 
And when we're at the end of that transition process, we'll have a shakeout. Of course we'll have a shakeout. You can't have several years of record-breaking growth without a shakeout. That will probably take the form of a recession, but not a depression. For it to be a depression, the baby boomers have to be able to continue to vote themselves everything that they've always wanted. But by the time we get to 2030, enough of them will be gone that it won't be an issue. We'll have to worry about the millennials' narcissism at that point, and that will probably trigger a recession too, but not a depression. So I, mean, I agree with a lot of the bits of their forecast. I just don't agree with the mosaic. So um, you mentioned, I'm uh, right here, sorry. Hi. Hi. Thanks for talking, speaking to us. Uh, you mentioned early on about how 50% uh, of the capital will leave when the, when the boomers um, exit out of that spending period. Maybe. Half of all private capital is, as, as of three years ago, boomer capital. Okay, great. And we've known about that since the 1960s. You were optimistic that we could do something about our demographic challenges by like 2060 and 2080. Oh, With the yeah, backdrop so. of the politics and everything else. I'm, I'm just optimistic. I'm saying 50 years is enough time for culture to twist in a new direction. And if we're under sustained financial and labor pressures, that's a good time window for technology to provide some insight and some solutions. So the next 10 years, I think we're pretty much stuck with the technology we've develop, developed today. But you know, necessity is the mother of invention. If we have 10 years of necessity, we will start coming up with new technologies and 20 years from now, those will start being applied at scale. And so by the time we get to 2060 to 2080, we're gonna be in a fundamentally different world. That's one of the reasons why I never make forecasts past about 35 years because that's kind of the window where the technology can go in directions you just have no idea. Peter, um, first of all, I like your tie. Thank you. <laughs> can you just comment on American immigration policy? And I just say that in a very open, because- Let I'm, me piss everyone off, because okay. I, because I want to be entertained. Okay, let's hit this from the economic angle first. We have Democrats graphic stagnation here and slow decline. So buttressing that with inward migration is an easy fix by the numbers. We all know it's not that simple, but we're in a situation where we need more and more labor and the weakest part in our system is lower skilled and unskilled labor. Because Americans, it costs over $150,000 to give the average American a high school education. That's expensive. And you're not going to have people who have earned that kind of, or been subject to that kind of training doing menial labor. So unless we have enough capital to automate everything, and we don't, we need fingers and eyes from somewhere else. And for those of you who are baby boomers, and you're looking at what's ahead of you in life, and say, assisted living, there aren't people to even attempt that right now. If we're going to get them, we're going to have to do what the Germans and the Japanese did, and that's bring them in from somewhere else. Because your kids, the millennials, you're not moving in with them. That was a one-way experience from their point of view. <laughs> okay, so the numbers are absolutely there supporting as open of a border as possible. Clearly that has political and cultural ramifications that we at this moment are not ready to accept. The unofficial position of the American business community from 1970 until five years ago was as open of a border as possible in order to provide for the labor force. We've had a switch. And remember, the the unions are swing voters now. The unions are one of two factions in the United States that are most against an open border because they don't want the competition for the jobs. And now that they're swing voters, the Democrats and the Republicans both have a vested interest in not even breathing the word immigration because they don't know how the unions are ultimately going to fall. Once the unions are folded into one coalition or another, then there's constraints on that because the coalition they're part of, they may be contained internally, and the coalition they're opposite of will see immigration as a good thing simply because the unions think it's a bad thing. So two years from now, probably more like four to six years from now, we'll get out of this political rut that we're in. Uh, the best way to secure the border is something that of all presidents, Jimmy Carter came up with. Back in 1979, 
just before everything went off the rails, or to 78, 78, uh, a couple of hurricanes hit Central America, and Jimmy Carter sent INS professionals down to Central America, specifically Honduras, to hand out three-year green cards for free. All you had to do was register. And then if you registered with your INS rep back in the States regularly, you paid your taxes, you kept your nose clean, after three years, you could either get a free ticket home, you could pay for a one-year extension that could be renewed, or you could start down the path to citizenship. And in the end, we got about half a million new citizens out of that program. Kept everybody in the system. There was no crime issue from that incoming group because they could see they were part of the system. I think the biggest thing that Donald Trump did wrong before January 6th, which is a whole different ball of wax, is that he closed down almost every legal path to immigration. And Biden has not chosen to reinstate those. So that has mean, meant that no matter who you are, if you have problems moving a broom or you can design a space station, your only way to get to the United States now is to come illegally. But Trump made it very easy to do that. The Chihuahuan and the Sonoran Deserts are the greatest natural barriers in the Western Hemisphere. And by building 50 construction roads across half of those deserts to build the wall, he has eliminated half of the natural border that kept illegal migrants out. He will go down in history as the greatest supporter of illegal migration into the US system. <laughs> So believe it or not, from an economic point of view, Donald Trump gave us exactly what we needed. He just did it in a way that isn't legal. It's weird, but that's where we are. So first off, great uh, video camera trickery on your YouTube videos. I had no idea you were so tall. <laughs> But uh, right. question, since you are, um, since you're here in the upper Midwest, right on the waters of Lake Michigan, you've talked about the Jones Act in Ugh. your books. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm curious, you know, you're talking about all this reshoring, the fact that we're gonna have this incredible industrial build out. Do you think that there's a, any path to having the Jones Act repealed? And if it were, how would that impact Milwaukee and the rest of the Sure, country? so the Jones Act, also known as the Interstate Commerce Act of 1920, is a change in regulatory structures that pulled a lot of control over America's waterways under the federal government, but also uh, made it so that any cargo transported between any two American ports, no matter the distance, had to be on a vessel that was built in America, owned by an American, captained by an American, and crewed by an American. Uh, and so as a result, the value of cargo that we ship among ourselves on water has reduced in real terms by, I think it's 98% over the intervening century. Um, it is the most protectionist law on the books, and it has definitely gutted the capacity for a lot of our coastal and riverine communities from benefiting from regional trade, local trade. Uh, because if you want to send something from Chicago to, um, well, let me give you a better example. If you want to send something from Fort Lauderdale, Miami, not only can it not be on a foreign vessel, that foreign vessel first has to go to another country, and then it can come back. It's called cabotage. Anyway, it's arguably the stupidest law in the books right now. And we don't do that for road, we don't do that for rail, we don't do that for flight. We only do it for water. And it costs about one twelfth as much to move cargo on water as it does by truck. So we have taken what is the best natural avenue for transport on the planet, the Greater Mississippi River System, the Great Lakes, and the uh, intercoastal on the East Coast and the, the Southern Coasts, and we basically Turn them off. So, if we need to massively expand the industrial plant, this is the low-hanging fruit. If we were to amend the Jones Act, not repeal it, amend it, just get rid of some of those really dumb clauses. Uh, not only would the foreign capital flight be going into something a little bit more constructive than just T-bills or apartments, uh, we would be able to build out any community that already has pre-existing port infrastructure. And I would argue that the cities in the country that would benefit the most from that adjustment, Charleston, Miami, Houston, New York, and Milwaukee. I was walking down the, oh, I love this name, Kamikrik. <laughs> <laughs> is 
that how that's said? Can I, can I? Yeah, yeah. Um, today, uh, thinking about this, it's like, you know, you guys already have all the hardware in place. If the regulatory structures change, you can hit the ground running tomorrow. Uh, and it would be really, really important for things like electronics, where the intermediate goods transport is really important. So yeah, this is very, very, very low-hanging fruit. Um, if we were to replace, not rebuild, not repair, replace every scrap of federal maritime infrastructure we have, that would cost less than the maintenance on the interstate highway system for one year. This is so easy. And the Koreans do it, the Japanese do it, the Russians do it, the Chinese do it, the Germans, the Dutch, the Swedes, the Turks, everyone does this already, Except the country with the best natural infrastructure on the planet. So just doing that, nothing else, that would give us five to ten percent economic growth for the country for the next twenty years. This is okay. this is the low hanging fruit. Yeah. All right. I want to second what you said. I'm over here on this side. Uh, for the port of Milwaukee, we launched Lake Express, which goes from Milwaukee to uh, Michigan and Lubars to capitalize it. We had to have that ship built at a port in Alabama that had never built a ship in the United States before. So you're, I'll second what you're saying. But anyhow, I want to return to Ukraine and Russia because it's such a big issue right sure. now. At the height of the Vietnam War, we all taught, if we don't stop them there, the communists are going to come over the wall and be the end of the world. Um, so I, I want to revisit Russia for a second sure. and their intention. Um, in Cuba missile crisis, they put missiles in Cuba um, on our doorstep and Kennedy took us to the brink of World War III to get them to stop. Well, Ukraine was being armed with missiles in Ukraine, pointed at Russia. The United States became a verbal advocate of NATO membership. Is there a reason that Russia had a right to be other side from the territorial ambition on their part to be, as they say, they may not be paranoid, but it doesn't mean people aren't hard to get them. Well, the Russians are paranoid and people are out to get them. So, so didn't they have a legitimate concern because the West literally said, screw you, we're not interested in taking missiles out yeah, of Ukraine. And if Mexico and Canada were willing to join the Warsaw Pact, I could see that argument. But they're not. People forget that NATO is an association of allies who have freely joined that association, and the veto power of every individual member for every new member is sacrosanct. That's why NATO has expanded so slowly, honestly. Uh, so I'm not saying that the Russians are wrong about their read of their geography. They're absolutely right. And NATO membership for Poland was a death blow to the relationship. But that dates back to the 2000s. It's easy to lay blame. The Russians have made bad decisions a century ago in World War I, and they're still paying the price for that demographically. And we, was there a possibility back in the 90s to go a different path that wouldn't lead to confrontation? Yeah, there was. But it would mean still having to divide in Germany and countries like Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Hungary, Romania, and Ukraine would be in this nether zone where a country that had just lost its empire would be free to play. There is no solution here that helps everyone. So we've got to choose what matters to us. Do we care about democracy? Do we care about free enterprise? Or, as the Russians have shown, are we okay with tortured children, or torture chambers that were designed for children? I mean, this, this is not a heavy lift intellectually. And now that the nuclear threats are coming fast and furious, it's really crystallized things I would like to think for a lot of people. Um, the scale of what we're dealing with, I agree with. The sensitivity, I agree with. But if you want to get really dark, I to explain what would happen if Russia wins. What if Russia loses? If Russia fails in this, they're done. But, and so they won't stop unless they can't fight. Which means for Ukraine to win, Ukrainian forces in some way, Ukrainian power in some variety is going to have to cross the border into Russia and neutralize the logistics hubs that allow the Russians to attempt the war. All of a sudden, now you're talking about a defensive use of nuclear weapons. We are in this horrible situation where the best case for us is for the Ukrainians to fight to the last Ukrainian. 
And the scary thing is, from all the Ukrainians I've spoken to, public and private, they are thrilled that that is an option. Because they have seen from the other side of the front line what the alternative is. I never said this was pretty. History rarely is. Peter, switching back to the economy in the next six to ten years, and you think about uh, this reshoring, the industrial build-out that we're going to need. You've answered, I think, by just by immigration, the Jones Act, a couple of examples. But what other level levers are available to us if capital is short and expensive and labor? Oh, well, I'm going to tell you exactly how this is going to go. So assuming for the moment that Congress can't function, not a reach, <laughs> most of the stuff that's going to matter is going to be state and local governments. Uh, some states and some local governments are better at that than others. Uh, Texas is wretched at industrial planning. They just drop taxes and they wait for someone to have a financing crisis. And then the governor and a bunch of mayors and a bunch of corporate folks get on a plane, fly there, and tell everybody, hey, come to Texas, uh, no income tax, and we're not going to charge corporate tax for the first 20 years. And we've got room on the plane. <laughs> Works great, but it's not planning. It's poaching. Uh, planning works much better in the South, where places like Charleston and um, Birmingham are really good at this. They basically go out and get foreign investors drunk. Uh, <laughs> trick them into signing some things. Vulnerable, you got an FDI contract. And it works, it works really well. And then they go and they change their own economic and educational systems to provide the specific workforce that the foreigner will need so that it's ready when they arrive. Um, the problem we have always had in the Midwest, always, 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 is you guys are just too damn earnest. Um, you've seen Field of Dreams, right? Build it and they will come. That is how you guys approach investment. You build an industrial park, you change the laws, and you just sit back and wait. And no one comes because they don't know about it. You have to go tell them. And I know that you guys are conservative. And if you don't, the Canadians are going to be in charge of it in your region, and that's going to be weird. <laughs> Because Toronto knows how to do this, and they've shown that they can do that, and they're on the same transport network you are, and they can even get around the little cabotage problem because they're so close. So, I mean, basically, you need to go out and sing your own prayer. I know that seems a little crass, but that's how you get a piece of this. The alternative, the only other alternative, is basically for Texas to redo the NAFTA expansion into northern Mexico. And I'd argue there's not enough labor to pull that off anymore. <coughs> Uh, but that is the only place where you've got that differentiated labor force. And about one-third of the economic growth we've seen in the United States in the last 20 years is because of that intersection. Texas has just hoovered it all up. I don't think they can pull that off again. But like I said, low-hanging fruit. You guys got the infrastructure. You have the educational system. You have the best demographic structure in the country outside of Utah, for reasons that are obvious. Uh, all the pieces are here. You just need to, to talk about yourselves. Sure. Hi. Um, Laura here. Hi. I have, Hi. Two, I have two questions. Oh, boy. All right. Question one is, based on your discussion of she, you, and based on occasionally you see in the news Chinese uh, war vessels uh, on exercise in the South China Sea, I didn't hear you talk about kind of a burning question you see all the time, the chances of China going into Taiwan. And the second thing is, I thought it was interesting this morning that the, I think it was the Wall Street Journal said that the most recent survey among business leaders for next year, business leaders no longer think we're gonna be in a recession next year. They're both, they're unrelated, sure. but I'm curious. Um, I point. understand completely why people think there will and will not be a recession. I don't have an opinion on my, my concern is that as demographics become glued on a global basis, that the relationship between supply and demand and labor and capital is becoming unmoored, and 500 years of patterns of modern economic theory might not mean as much just around the corner. 
So maybe our measures aren't as accurate as we think they are. Now here in the United States, where we have a healthier demography, our number one trading partner is Mexico, which has a very healthy demography. This transition will be much slower and more of our old rules will apply. But for the rest of the world, it's game on. And I just don't know. So that's that. Uh, Taiwan, I, I don't know if there's gonna be a war. Xi is not getting information to make decisions in a confident way. And in that sort of environment, it's not that I think a war is obvious or not obvious, I just, I don't know. Because, like, the balloon, it was headline news here for three weeks, and it wasn't until the third week that someone told Xi about it. So, it's like, how, how do you judge the decision-making of a person when you don't know what information that he has? Uh, another great example, it's like, you remember when they were having power outages in 2021? Started in February, Xi didn't find out about it until September. You know who told him? Joe Biden, on a Zoom call. It came up in conversation. He had no idea before that. And you know, Joe Biden is many things to many people, but I don't think anyone thinks of him as a source of breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> so just predicting Xi's actions require a data set that doesn't exist. I mean, I can look at Russia and the military operations and what's happening in commodities markets and make an educated guess as what they're going to do. It doesn't apply to Xi because he doesn't have access to that information. Um, if, if a war happens. I, most of the folks in the military that I've spoken to expect it would be over in six weeks, which is less time than it would take for American Air Force carrier battle groups to get from the West Coast over to Taiwan and it would all be done. Let's assume for the moment that is true. So, the Chinese can't run their own semiconductors, they certainly can't run TSMCs. Uh, and two destroyers in an ocean basin is all over anyway. They knew that five years ago. I don't know if they know that now. Then there's a question of whether it's even true. If you've so gutted your civilian decision-making process, we're pretty sure at least a degree of that has happened in the military system as well. And if information can't flow within the military system, you get a lot of dead soldiers and sailors. Three, Taiwan is many things. One of them, it's a pretty sh they've got a pretty sharp technical acumen. Their first nuclear power plant was built in the early 70s. They built their own one in the 80s, which means they have everything that they need should they feel the need to build a nuke. Now, the Chinese, again, five years ago, knew that if they did a slow buildup of forces to get the million men ready, the Taiwanese would see that, and they would build some nukes, and they might be able to capture Taiwan, but it would probably cost them Beijing, Shanghai, and Fujian. So, the unofficial battle plan is just to text everybody, tell them to go to a port, grab a fishing boat, and sail. They'd lose several hundred thousand men doing that. A war for Taiwan is not something that they would do likely as of five years ago. The question is, after you fire hose yourself with propaganda for five years, whether you've changed your mind, and I don't know. Last question. Ooh, no pressure. Right here, Peter. Uh, thank you for sharing all your thoughts with us. You've talked quite a bit about China. Could you share some thoughts on India? Is there any thought in particular that you're curious about? Oh, sure. Well, they've already passed China in terms of population. Uh, they've got a financial system that values money as an economic good instead of a political good. So we'll never have this sort of financial overexposure that the Chinese have. But they will never have any partners. All of their neighbors hate them. The feeling is mutual. And they and all of those neighbors are ringed by a very hostile geography of deserts and mountains and jungles or desert mountains and desert jungles. So they can't physically integrate with anyone at all. But it's a billion and a half people with multiple economic systems within their own country. Think of them more as a, honestly, a multi-ethnic conglomeration of empires in a country personally. And that's a plus economically because they can get that differentiation that we can't. But they also won't trade with anyone. They didn't join globalization. They were pro-Soviet. And then the Soviet system died and they remained pro-Soviet. For them, it's an ideological identification. 
So we will speak with them. We can get a degree of friendliness with them. We might even cooperate on some security matters with them. But they're not friends, and they're not allies. They will pick up manufacturing. They're going to have to do the same thing that we are going to have to do. They're going to have to make it themselves, but they will have no partners doing that. And so they will make things to a quality level that satisfy their needs, not looking at us. I'm not saying there'll be no trade. I'm just saying they're not part of our solution and vice versa. I don't think we're going to fall into any sort of meaningful hostility with New Delhi, but we're also not going to fall into any sort of major partnership with New Delhi. The Indians are their own thing. They're also the first stop out of the Persian Gulf, so they'll never have an energy crisis either. But they are going to become pirates. Arg. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you to Kathy. Uh, we couldn't do it without her.